This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I would like for you to consider an excerpt. The current U.S. administration, the president, their Department of Justice, and the Department of Education have ruled that anatomically male teenagers who think that they are girls have the right to shower and change clothes in girls' locker rooms, end quote. That is a choice. That is a political choice that is being made in the United States of America. I don't care what your opinion is, and frankly, my opinion is not necessarily relevant either. But there is something interesting here beyond politics. Critical thinking. So let's ponder this for a moment. Because us males, we can all imagine, back in the day, 13, 14, 15 years of age, if suddenly the school said to us that on Wednesday, with our junk still firmly attached to our body, that we could declare that we were a girl for the afternoon to get access to the female locker room, how long would the line be? It'd be pretty damn long. Because I know what, every damn teenage boy out there would be saying, let's go ahead and be girls for the day. In all seriousness, how in the world could this possibly relate to behavioral economics, behavioral finance, decision-making, investing, trading? How in the world, Mr. Covell, could opening your podcast by discussing the fact that a young male who declares to his school, again, junk still attached to his body, that he's a girl, and now the current administration has said that that Male, who thinks he's a girl, can go to the girl's locker room. It actually opens up more than critical thinking. First, look at the poor girls. What teenage girl wants to be in a position, to be in a situation, where she has to be changing clothes next to a guy who says he's a girl, even though he's clearly still a guy? It's Pandora's box of insanity. Again, you might say, what is this related to? Why would you even go this direction? What's the point? Are you just going down some typical political path that we can all see from 100 miles away? Not exactly. I love the fact that so many people can't think straight. It's fantastic. All it will further do is ensure in the future that markets, which are made up of human beings with all of their biases and their impulses and their faulty and perhaps not so faulty decision-making will all show up at the game and they will decide what they think the price is based on however they feel, however they think. Rationality? Efficiency? No. The reason Daniel Kahneman, the reason Vernon Smith won their Nobel Prizes in behavioral economics, behavioral finance, is because they know the human condition doesn't change. So this great example, a young teen male strolling into the woman's locker room, the girl's locker room, a fully intact male, it just talks to the mind, the mind of the populace. How do people think? Earlier in 2015, all the conversation was about Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner. That was the topic of conversation. Now, six, seven months later, this is already filtered down to the high school level across the United States of America. And people are in conflict. They don't know what to do. Again, 
This is fantastic if one believes in what Kahneman and Smith have established throughout their career. Now, please, I'm not attempting to connect Daniel Kahneman and Vernon Smith to my particular point of view and to how I'm connecting all of these things. But when I look at this inability for a wide cross-section of the United States population, this inability to think, well, it sure seems like behavior will continue to play a huge role in the markets. And if one has a firm understanding of how flawed we are as human beings, how messed up in the head we are, our inability to decipher, to figure out, to consider reason, to critically think, that's surely not going to change. I thought that was a great foundation for where I want to go today in my podcast. I want to go towards the parallels that exist in sports and investing. Now, I have talked about this in my podcast recently. I brought up Earl Weaver, the original Moneyball manager of the Baltimore Orioles. Today, I will take a different take at sports and investing to draw some parallels. My inspiration today comes from Howard Marks, one of the world's most successful investors a true contrarian and his thinking and writing, some great long form content that he has produced from his firm that you should go read. He always gets me to think. Today, I'm going to reach into one of Mark's most recent papers called Inspiration from the World of Sports. And he talks about these parallels, these parallels between investing and sports. He's listed ways and I'm going to quote him exactly. He's listed ways in which investing is like sports. Number one, it's competitive. Some succeed and some fail. And the distinction is clear. Wow, isn't he right on the money there? Some succeed. Not everyone succeeds. Everyone might feel rich from a buy and hold perspective when a market is at an all-time high like the S&P. But let's don't be silly and think that everybody will get those gains. Because the moment the door opens, this way to the egress, as P.T. Barnum would have said, the moment the gates open, everyone will run, trying to secure those profits. Marx also talks about being quantitative. Investing and sports are both quantitative. One of my favorite sites to go look at, and I will talk about that in this podcast, is the baseball reference site. Just miles and miles of data for just about every player that's ever played. I think it is every player that's ever played in Major League Baseball, perhaps Minor League too. The numbers are there in black and white. You can go down the sports. You can see, you know who has scored the most points in an NBA career. You know who has the most home runs in a baseball career, steroids or not. Marx also talks about the parallel between sports and investing, meritocracy. In the long term, the better returns go to superior investors. Now we listen to, in the offseason, six months of Tom Brady supposedly having an entire career related to underinflated footballs. Looks like that point of view, if you had it, was not so wise. Because at the end of the day, you can see who excels. And it's all based on merit. You do it, we can see it. You don't do it, we can see it. Marx also talks about the parallel of being team-oriented. Even if your team is small, everyone needs people on their team to help facilitate, to help push the goal forward. And lastly, it's satisfying and enjoyable, but much more so when you win. Absolutely. Who the hell wants to lose? Every memory I can have 
about playing baseball from a kid into college. It's the winning. It's the winning. Doing something to prevail at the end. It's the same with investing. Now, of course, you can't just say in investing or in sports, I will win every time. That's impossible. I'm going to break that apart in a minute. Marx also makes the point that an investment career can feel like a basketball or football game with an unlimited number of quarters. The benchmark. I've talked about this in my books. Absolutely makes zero sense to say to yourself, I will hold myself to what return that I make this month. What return did I make this quarter? What return did I make this year? It could be all entirely random. And if your system, if your understanding of your system is not set up in such a way that you don't understand process versus outcome, and you're sitting around saying to yourself, well, my quarterly performance was this, and this just must mean that I'm such and such. I mean, quarterly performance is the worst judge the worst barometer of performance. So many, so many people today literally goose up their quarterly performance in an effort to make those people that refuse to acknowledge how poor a quarterly performance metric is, they goose the performance up to fool those people that refuse to take the horse blinders off. Don't think in terms of quarterly performance. Now, of course, as Marx points out, an investor, a trader, it is unlimited. Over time, it's your entire lifetime. That's the measuring stick, the true measuring stick. What is the performance over significant years and decades one of the reasons that I've absolutely loved to dig into the trend following topic is because of the performance data. You can see it, as Marx says, in black and white. I am not attempting to say that Howard Marx is a trend following trader. I don't know. I don't think he is. That's not the point. The trend following performance is in black and white. You can look at it. There is so much to be gleaned. Let's say you're a brand new person to the investing field and you've heard about trend following. You've heard about the turtles, for example. You've heard about John Henry or Bill Dunn or David Harding. Absolutely go find their performance tables. Look at their month by month performance and see if you can see something within the performance that strikes you. The up months, the down months. How do the up and down months among managers look? Even from an eyeball correlation test, do you see patterns? Is there room to further investigate those numbers? The quick, short answer, absolutely there is, and you should. I want to dig into Howard Mark's memo outlining parallels between sports and investing a little bit more. In this memo, he also talks about Yogi Berra, the famed baseball catcher for the New York Yankees that recently died. Yogi has these great comments, these great one-liners, these great philosophical precepts, which to me often feel like he was a closet Buddhist, a Zen master, something that kind of sounds simple, but then when you read it and you think about it, well, there's a lot of depth behind that. Let me read an excerpt from Marx about Yogi Berra. Yogi was selected to play in the All-Star Game every year from 1948 through 1962. He was among the top three vote-getters for American League Most Valuable Player every year from 1950 through 1956, and he was chosen as MVP in three of those years. The Yankees teams on which he played won the American League pennant and thus represented the league in the World Series 14 times, and they won the World Series 10 times. He was an important part of one of the greatest dynasties in the history of sports. And Marx goes on to say that what he loved about Yogi was his consistency. All of those baseball metrics, those classic baseball metrics that I mentioned that you can all find at Baseball Reference. 
Marx points out how consistent Yogi was. And Marx goes on to further say that as an investor, that's what he wants. That's what he likes, the consistency. Consistency and minimization of error are two of the attributes that characterize Yogi's career, and they can also be key assets for superior investors. They aren't the only ways for investors to excel. Some great ones strike out a lot, but hit home runs in bunches the way Reggie Jackson did. Reggie, nicknamed Mr. October because of his frequent heroics in the World Series, was one of the top home run hitters of all time. But he also holds the record for the most career strikeouts, and his ratio of the strikeouts to home runs was four times Yogi's, 4.61 versus 1.16. Marx goes on to say, and to repeat his central point, consistency and minimization of error have always ranked high among my priorities, and they still do. I don't think Marx in that paragraph, and he says there are other ways to do it, I don't think he was attempting to belittle Reggie Jackson 100%, but he was definitely saying, I'd rather have Yogi than Reggie because I want the consistency. I don't know if this is a fair comparison. I don't know if this comparison really makes sense. For me personally, I look at Reggie Jackson and I say that's more how the world really works. The world, the real world today is more about strikeouts and then a home run. Strikeouts then a home run. If you can't predict tomorrow and you still have to swing every day, you're not going to get a hit each time. You're sure as hell not going to get a home run each time. So with my experience and knowing plenty of investors that have the Reggie Jackson model, and maybe they would say, Mike, I don't want you to compare me to Reggie Jackson, but I can look at many trend-following traders over the decades Guys like Bill Dunn, guys like Larry Height, they have their share of strikeouts. They take their losses, and then they hit home runs. I might argue that a Yankees team, before baseball expansion, dominated by New York money, with the ability to attract the best players, the best players surrounding Yogi, Maybe that's not a fair comparison to Reggie. Maybe that's not a fair comparison at all to try and make the point. Consistency versus the home run. What I want you to see here is that with Marx taking the consistency side and giving some props to the Reggie Jackson home run model, I'd rather see the Reggie Jackson home run model put more on the same plane with consistency. The Reggie Jackson home run model has more to do with, for example, venture capital, film financing, the MIT blackjack team, trend following trading. Consistency of result is very difficult to achieve. Extremely difficult. I'm not even sure it should be the goal. Now, many investors want that to be the goal, but those might be the same investors that I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast that are having issues with critical thinking. That still imagine the markets are efficient. And look, I know Howard Marks doesn't think the markets are efficient. He is one of my favorite writers. I just want to make this point. I just want the audience to see that Reggie and Yogi can be on the same plane. Then it comes down to you. What do you want? What do you want to pursue over the course of a lifetime? Consistency or the home run? It's a choice. Nobody can make it for you. You have to do the reading. You have to do the research. You have to dig in and really want it and find out what's the best option for your particular situation, your family, your friends, etc. I want to end with Yogi Berra, the philosopher. Inspired again from Howard Marks' writing. Yogi was famous, as I mentioned, for many of the one-liners that he would say. Sports nuts knew his one-liners, but even regular people knew about Yogi Berra's one-liners. 
Let me read a few of these, courtesy of Howard Marks. It's like deja vu all over again. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. You can observe a lot just by watching. Always go to other people's funerals, otherwise they won't come to yours. I knew the record would stand until it was broken. The future ain't what it used to be. You wouldn't have won if we'd beaten you. I never said most of the things that I said. And to end, let me read another excerpt from Mark's piece. Quote, baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical, end quote. That was another of Yogi's dicta, and I think it's highly useful when thinking about investing. 90% of the effort to outperform may consist of financial analysis, but you need to put another 50% into understanding human behavior. The market is made up of people, and to beat it, you have to know them as well as you do the thing you're considering investing in. I sometimes give a presentation titled The Human Side of Investing. Its main message surrounds just that. While investing draws on knowledge of accounting, economics, and finance, it also requires insight into psychology. Why? Because investors' objectivity and rationality rarely prevail as much as investment theory assumes, and emotion and human nature often take over instead. That's why my presentation is subtitled, quote, In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is, end quote. Yogi said that too, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. You can easily see why I led this podcast off with a controversial, perhaps arguably political point about young teen males looking to go into girls' locker rooms. It's the human condition. It's the psychological, it's the biases, it's the rationality, it's the irrationality. It's all on the table when it comes to investing. People will always be people. The examples, the craziness, it will never stop. You, as an investor, you as a trader, you need a strategy, you need something that allows you to take advantage of this, the human condition. It's the most important thing. The rules are relatively easy. The system is relatively easy. It's believing that people are people and not about to change anytime soon. That's the hard part. Can you really spend your life believing that the human condition won't change. Because if you can, you've got a leg up on the masses. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash, or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.